What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you a video about Black Geyser and what to expect in the first parts of the game. So right off the bat, this is a sponsored video from the developer and publisher of Black Geyser, Grape Ocean Technologies and Vicarious Publishing, respectively. Black Geyser is launching today for the price of $29.99, and it is an old-school CRPG-inspired title. So if you've played the likes of Baldur's Gate 1 or 2, Icewind Dale, or perhaps the even more recent Pillars of Eternity, you should feel right at home here. Now, I personally play and review a ton of CRPGs. They are a bit of a specialty of mine. So for this particular sponsored video, I decided to mix it up a little bit and kind of talk through the beginning parts of the game about some of the systems I enjoy and kind of show things off. And if you're interested in the title or seeing more than that beyond just gameplay, I did also put up a sponsored new player's guide yesterday as well that I will link in the description below. But with no further ado, let's jump into this. So Black Geyser starts where most games do, and that is character creation. Now character creation is going to give you the options of five races as well as 13 different classes. The races are human, dwarf, elf, feldegug, which is a snow elf, and the rillo, which are a sort of elephant-inspired race that are fairly unique. This being an RPG, these classes are going to give us plus and minuses to our various attributes, as well as resistances or weaknesses to certain elements or damage types. And then we move on to our class. Now there are 13 classes and they are all modeled after four archetypes. That is to say the priest, the rogue, the fighter, or the mage. All 13 classes fall into one of those categories. You can multi-class, you can pick up to three classes. However, doing so will increase the amount of experience required to level up. And I will tell you that is not an insignificant amount. Just as someone who is dual classing, I'm regularly a level or two behind my companions who are a single class. So something to keep in mind there. But you can mix and match how you please, and you can offset some of the weakness of your chosen class by picking up another one, but then we're off to attributes. If you've ever played an RPG before, you pretty much know what these do. I did want to mention here, though, that while these aren't final by any means, this is where you will get most of your attributes, period, as throughout the game you won't really increase your attributes anymore. However, you can increase them through items. So this is like a semi-final of what you're going to have throughout the game. Then we move on to our skills and spells. The class-specific stuff is relegated to your four class archetypes. Each of those classes will get various things that they can put class-specific stuff into. Weapons are your hit chance, and the general stuff is a little bit of crafting and your persuade option, basically. And then we have our appearance customization. This is going to let us pick the major and minor color of our outfit, or the armor and stuff that we're wearing normally, as well as some of the cosmetic options. This is also where we pick one of our character portraits. And we can pick a hairstyle and facial hairstyle. Then we move on to name and voice, as there are several voices. And we can also pick difficulty at this particular stage, of which there are four. I will say, playing mostly on classic myself, at least currently, I have, as someone experienced with CRPGs, pretty much been demolishing the content. So if you play a lot of these types of games, you might want to crank it up a little bit from the very beginning. And from there, we kick off the game proper. So as we start the title, we are going to be confronted by a woman named Beline, who explains to us that we are a servant working for the noble Lord Espen. And this is where the game kicks off. Now, before we kick the game off, I want to talk a little bit about the greed mechanic. So something to keep in mind as you play throughout the game is that the world is subject to a greed level. Your actions have the potential to slow this down or speed this up because the crux of the game is that there is a curse of greed that has affected the world previously, and it seems to be recurring now. So taking actions that are very greedy in nature will push the greed level forward. However, if you're playing an evil guy, that might very well be the point of what you're trying to do. But feel free to roleplay with that a little bit. There's no wrong answers. It will, however, change the world and how it reacts. But something to keep in mind. Now, whenever we're ready, we can check out the small tutorial of some of the UI. For instance, the game will tell us to open the map to get a overview of the area we are in. And once we're inside the mansion, pro tip, steal everything that isn't nailed down, which is hilarious given that I just told you about the greed mechanic. But in the prologue here, taking all this stuff, none of it is marked as unauthorized, so you're allowed to just walk through here and pick everything up. And honestly, you can find some pretty good items just wandering around and 
snagging everything you can. I will say though, later in the game, things will be marked as unauthorized. You'll actually see it above the inventory pane there. And stealing from those things will provoke a reaction from the people around up to the point of attacking you outright. Now, once you're done exploring the ground floor, we have to do what Baleen said and basically go to Lord Espen and serve a meeting of nobles their drinks. Now, Baleen will actually tell you the appropriate way to serve the drinks, and you can get it wrong, and most of the nobles will admonish you for it. But shortly thereafter, they get into a conversation about the ongoing conflict between the capital of Isilmereld, as well as the mining town of Derengould. Darren Gould is not happy with the way things have been going and has staged a bit of a civil war with the king of Isilmereld. Now, Lord Espen is firmly behind the king as far as we know, but these nobles are having a conversation about the ongoing conflict, which is shortly thereafter interrupted by an attack on the estate, which is where things actually get a little interesting. Because as you might imagine, if you picked up Black Geyser, you were probably expecting a party-based RPG with combat and things, and not to play servant to House Espen. Now at this point, Lord Espen gathers you and a couple guards and leads you through the house, where you will get attacked by a few of the attackers from Darren Gould, presumably. Now the game actually does point this out, that you do not have to engage in the combat here. The warriors themselves will be able to handle themselves for this. However, if you want to, you can engage in the combat here, and it acts as a sort of small tutorial for hitting things. And they've actually smoothed this part out a lot from the early access period. So this game was originally kickstarted and then moved into early access. And during early access, it was very easy to die right here. So they've kind of balanced that out a little bit, because, you know, you're not supposed to die right here, as you might imagine, as this is a bit of a prolonged tutorial, let's be honest. But once the enemies are dead with or without your help, you should definitely loot all the bodies, pick up all of their gear. Some of it might be useful to you, depending on the class you have chosen. But either way, grab the valuable stuff and carry on. You will get into another fight with the guards at the hallway, and then you will move into a sort of private room. At this point, Lord Espen will want to have a conversation with you specifically, and he'll eventually tell you to go get the sword out of his dressing chamber. So when you go to get the sword, he actually locks you into the dressing chamber, at which point Lord Espen's son, Aldenar, barges into the estate of Lord Espen, makes it very clear that he is the one leading this charge against his father and has turned traitor, and then he kills his father outright. But then our character hears a mysterious voice and is promptly knocked out, and then we wake up in a shack confronted by an old woman who tells us it is time to get some rest. All in all, a bit of a weird occurrence, but you really don't have much other choice than to get some rest right here, which you can do by clicking the rest button down in the corner there. And then when you wake up, the crone, as she is called, will continue to, for the most part, completely ignore your questions about Lord Espen and everything that just happened, saying that there's basically nothing that you can do about it, and she needs you to go outside and collect the ingredients for a stew that she's planning on tonight. So she gives you some gloves, a recipe, and sends you outside. Now out here we can meet a poisoned druid who will give us a small quest to kill some of the spiders in and around the area, but for the most part we just have to gather the herbs and the fox meat for the crone stew and then come back. Now from here the crone, if you couldn't tell, is acting as a bit more of a tutorial, kind of explaining a lot of mechanics for you and basically getting ready to send you out into the world. So now that we've got the ingredients, she's going to be giving us explanations on how to dry said ingredients with the drying skill. And once we've got that completely done, she will give us a bit of a dialogue about everything going on in the world. And she will actually be the person who explains to our character that the curse of greed is spreading. This was something that has happened before, but was apparently contained. However, this time it's starting to spread over the land. And it's considered a curse that slowly and steadily people are succumbing to the curse of greed, which is presumably what led to the conflict between Azelmereld and Darren Gould, which has largely been about prices and the valuable ore coming out of the Darren Gould mines. Now, from here, the crone will continue to give us some instruction. This time, she will explain to us a few different things, depending on your class, actually. So if you are a spellcaster, she'll explain how to scribe scrolls, use your magical detection to get rid of magical traps, if you're a warrior, she'll teach you how to use your force lock and command company abilities. If you're a rogue, she'll teach you how to stealth and pickpocket, etc. And if you're a priest, she'll teach you how to abolish curses or use the prey ability. 
And basically this part of the game is a small tutorial about how to use the class specific abilities and get the most out of your chosen class archetype. But from here we get the reward that was in her chest. Then she goes on to further explain that she's clearly been trying to get you ready for the world, which is very obvious both in her actions, but is also a fun narrative way to explain a tutorial since your entire life has basically been spent in service to a noble and you might not know so much about adventuring. But more importantly, she also drops a bit of a bombshell on your character, but probably not so much of a surprise to you, in that Lord Espen was actually your character's father. It would appear Lord Espen had an affair of some sort at some point, and the man who killed Lord Espen, Aldnar, is actually your half-brother. This is why Lord Espen afforded you, technically a servant, so much freedom, shall we say, in conducting yourself. And it would seem all of the events up to this point, the civil war going on in Azelmereld, along with the events of someone like Aldnar killing his own father, are all symptoms, if you will, of this curse of greed that is spreading over the land. But from here, she has to kick you out, off into the world to go fulfill your destiny, as is standard in these RPGs. But more importantly, the first thing you need to do is travel to Isilbright, because you are the son of a nobleman who just died, and it is about time you collect what is rightfully yours in life. So our first objective from here, after leaving what is essentially the tutorial, is to head towards Isilbright, and find a way to claim the lordship, if you will, of House Espen. From this point, we can finally leave the hidden cabin area. And the only place we're going to be able to go from here is actually a place called Merchant's Road. Now, Merchant's Road is probably our first big area to kind of explore, if you will. And one of the main things you can do here is find a dwarf next to a sort of ruined caravan named Helgenhar. And he is your first companion. He'll join you pretty easily. And then on your way out of the area, you can actually find a merchant as well. So if you're still lacking anything equipment-wise for your chosen archetype, this should probably be the place you choose to pick it up, but you can also wait until you get to the capital, no big deal. And as soon as you're done exploring the Merchant's Road, which is a relatively small area with some relatively low-level enemies, you can, when you're ready, head north, and this will lead you to the Gates of Isilbright. Now, you will be stopped at the gate, of course, by a guard asking what your intentions are, and moreover, how you feel about the Darren Gould Rebellion. And I mention this because it makes me laugh that they give you the options of I witnessed them kill my father with my own eyes, rebels are bad, and I will strangle them to death with their own innards. And no matter the option you choose, the guard says, good enough, go in. Now, immediately at the gate, once you get on the inside of the actual city, you're going to be assaulted by some thugs, if you will. Now, you can pretty easily talk your way out of this situation one way or another. You can either give them a potion, which their friend needs, you can just straight up intimidate them, or you can just pay them if you want to go that route, I suppose. But nonetheless, you have options. But your main objective in the capital city is to find out how and if you can claim your birthright as a Lord of House Espen. And there are two ways to do this. But naturally, you would go around exploring the city, and the main objective can pretty easily lead you to the methods of acquiring that knowledge. So essentially what you need to do is find the Hall of Records in the Castle District, and there are two ways of going about this. And I mention this right here because one of them actually involves these thugs that accost you at the gate. Because these thugs are in possession of an amulet that belongs to a noble. One of the two ways of getting into the Halls of Records is recovering that amulet and returning it to a noble in one of the districts of the city, who will then grant your character access to the Hall of Records, because in order to get into the Hall of Records, you have to have permission of a noble. The other method of doing so is finding one of your companions, which is markedly easier, mind you, because all you have to do there is go to the tavern, help Bajala Adelis, stop getting hassled by suitors at the tavern, and once you do so, she will join your party, and as thanks for helping her out of that situation, she, a noble herself, will also give you access to the Halls of Records. But before you actually go there, what I would recommend doing instead is exploring the city as you can fill out your other companion slots here. You can go near the temple and find your cleric or your priest by the name of Saraka. She will join your party after you help her get away from some assassins trying to kill her. And then you can pick up your rogue, Hamlin, in the Greybark district, who is actively stealing something and gets away with it and offers to join your party right after. Now, there are a few side quests to be undertaken around the capital, and while you're exploring the capital city, two quests that I would very much so recommend that you do 
are located in the market district and the gray bark district. So in the market district, specifically in the temple, one of the priests there can give you a quest to go kill some undead at Merchant Road. Now this is nice and easy. There's a few of them so you can gather your companions, go take care of these undead, come back. You can find an amulet on those undead, which can give you a second quest, which you can go turn in over at the guard headquarters, which will net you a whole bunch of experience and quite a bit of gold if you choose to accept it for, honestly, not that much work. And then the second quest is actually located in the graveyard area of the Grave Bark District. You first need to wait until daytime to talk to the gravekeeper or the grave digger, and he will give you a quest to investigate the graveyard at night to figure out the cause of a bunch of noise. And upon returning to the graveyard at night, there are two things you can find here. In one of the crypts, you can actually complete the quest by defeating some shambling horrors or just some undead creatures, really. And these guys can honestly be a little bit tough early on, but defeating them will turn in the quest. When you go back to the grave diggers, you can get a reward there. But just south of that, on the farther end of the graveyard, you can actually find a bunch of grave robbers who will attack you. And if you defeat them, you can actually find some fantastic equipment on them, as well as what is likely your first cursed item, which if you have Soraka with you, she can use Abolish Curse to get rid of the curse. But combined with the armor that these characters drop, you can get a pretty tremendous haul just from a couple of quests. And if that's not enough for you, you don't actually have to go straight to the Hall of Records. If you prefer to do a little exploring, if you go back to the Merchant Road and take the southern exit, you can go to an area called the Screaming Barrow, and from there you can clear out that area and explore it, find some more quests, and you can actually continue traveling for quite a ways and explore a decent chunk of the map, though not everything will be available to you this early on in the game. You can nonetheless find and explore quite a few optional areas, that will get you some experience and ready to go. So if you would like to do a bit of preparation before heading into the next part of the game, which we're about to talk about, this is a really convenient and easy time to do it, which will give you the resources you need to go to the merchants and the capital and kind of stock up and gear up your party to get you ready for the trials to come, shall we say. But main story-wise, whenever you're ready, you can go to the Hall of Records, where of course it turns out that, unsurprisingly, the records about your birth that the Hall of Records have is quite false. It was forged. And basically, there's no way to prove that you were a legitimate heir to the House Espen name. And then you are given the task to travel back to the Espen Manor and recover some, if any, record of your potential birth. Because if you can find it, that would make you a proper Lord of House Espen. Now, while we have absolutely engaged in some small battles with enemies up to this point, House Espen is a sort of mini dungeon. It obviously has the same layout as when you were just there previously at the very beginning of the game, but that area is going to act as your first little dungeon area. And while we're about to end the video here, because while I don't want to show off too much, I will say that the estate of House Espen is like your first little mini dungeon, and you should not go there without being prepared. There are quite a few enemies, including a particularly strong one, and while you can avoid a lot of them, I imagine most people are going to want to enter the fight. So make sure you are prepped and ready to go before heading out to the Espen Estate. But furthermore, on that note, while the game itself does present a great deal of tutorial and getting people used to the mechanics, which overall I think is a great idea, I will say the plot picks up significantly after you get back from the Estate of Lord Espen. So from that point on, the game gets a lot more interesting, the plot picks up, you're doing a lot more stuff, and if you're waiting for the part where you do a lot of exploring and dungeon diving, that's about to happen, as the first 30 minutes to an hour of the game, depending on your playstyle, is largely just easing you into the mechanics, giving you a rundown of how everything works, which for a CRPG like this, I think is a really good idea, because these games tend to be very dense, with not well-explained mechanics, whereas here the developers clearly put a lot of effort, actually, into explaining a lot of the finer details of what is going on, especially on a mechanical level, which I appreciated. But if anything that I mentioned here is still a bit of a mystery to you, again, new player guide linked in the description below. But that is going to do it for today. That is the first 30 minutes to an hour or so of gameplay that you can expect from Black Geyser, Couriers of Darkness, again, launching today for the price of $29.99. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. 
But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.